what I'm up to tonight is a little more complex technically than the last session was. And I, uh, to be honest, have been having some trouble keeping the tech working. Uh, so it could skate on us at any moment, but I will, I will get as far as I get and, uh, and we'll see if anybody manages to learn anything from it. Uh, I want to look first at the actual setup itself from, uh, from, from three different perspectives, actually. Uh, let me just uh, share a screen here. Uh, okay, so what you're looking at now is what's actually set up on a table to my right. Uh, and I pulled out two of the oldest schools since I, I have available. There's a, a DSI Evolver here and a, a MicroCork. Uh, and as you can see, there are cables running all over the place. But the, the thing at the lower left here that I'm running my mouse over at the moment that has the, the, the red tape on it is an iConnect uh, MIDI 2 Plus interface that basically channels MIDI and audio in and out of the iPad. Uh, just above it here is a little Macmillan keyboard that is magically turned into a MIDI keyboard by this expander device here, which we don't really need to worry about. Suffice it to say, it's a keyboard. It puts out MIDI notes. Uh, and we'll take advantage of that later. And then up here in the left-hand corner is just the audio interface that's running the whole thing into the computer so that you can hear it. Uh, and in fact, if I, if I key it, hopefully you will hear it, uh, or at least you did. Yes, we did. Okay, so that's what we're working with tonight. Two synths, uh, neither of them has a USB connector. They just, they just take MIDI. Uh, Micro Korg Evolver interface to the iPad, interface to the uh, to the computer for, for Zoom purposes and a, and a keyboard. Um, so that's that's the first part of this. Uh, let me uh, let me now see if I can move to a different shot and show you something else here. So yeah, this is um, I have to do the screen again. Here we go. This is what the front of the uh, iConnect MIDI uh, interface looks like. It has all sorts of nice little blinking lights that, that supposedly tell you what's going on. Uh, there's a USB uh, B jack here to connect to a computer that's not in use at the moment. There's a USB B jack here that is actually connected to the iPad that I'm using. Uh, if you look at the back, you see that it has two MIDI in and out uh, connections for connecting to instruments. And actually, uh, let me show you how I've done that tonight. Whoop, stop that. Come back. There we go. <laughs> uh, that's a dodo. Uh, and this is an iPad uh, that's connected by a USB uh, connection to the iConnect MIDI 2 Plus. Uh, Going into the iConnect, there is a QNexus keyboard, that Macmillan keyboard we were looking at a minute ago, that is sending MIDI on channel six. Uh, coming out of the iConnect MIDI, well, coming out is a of this of the second MIDI connection is a single cable that runs to the DSI Evolver's MIDI input comes out of it, and then there's another cable that comes out of the MIDI through connection to run to the micro core. The Evolver is listening on MIDI channel six. The MicroCorg is listening on MIDI channel five, which is how we get by with running two synths off one cable. We're using different channels. Uh, the Evolver is feeding uh, MIDI back into the iConnect MIDI 2 Plus uh, because at some point in the demo, if we get around to it, I might try using it as a sequencer to drive the iPad, although that's just showing off and there's, there's no real reason to do it. Uh, everybody okay so far? Yes, sir. Okay, so we've got. Okay. Uh, we, sorry, I said Carl, was that good. okay? <laughs> okay, hearing nothing. I'm assuming that, that that everybody's all right with this. So let's ditch out of that. I'm not going to talk about audio routing uh, for the moment because it's complicated and idiosyncratic. And in the case of what I've got set up tonight, it is entirely driven by the needs of Zoom. 
uh, and not by anything that you would actually do in the field. <laughs> so I think we can, I, I think we're safer if we ignore it, but I will say that, that both instruments and my microphone are being fed in uh, through an eight channel, regular old uh, Mackie eight channel, channel mixer. Uh, the sound that you're getting from the iPad, you're actually getting through the uh, through the screen through the screen share, or did I figure out a way to get around that? I don't remember, uh, <laughs> but it is uh, it is to say the least a real lash up, uh, and and not something that I would recommend that you try at home. Uh, but it does actually get the uh, the audio there. Um, I'm I'm trying to keep it simple too, and not give the iPad any control over the levels that are actually going out to Zoom because uh, that that keeps things simple. Uh, as to what's going on inside the iPad, uh, let me disappear that. Um, let me go back to screen sharing again. So this, all of you who were around last week will recognize as uh, a, a view of the ALM, uh, ALM setup. Uh, on the left there, I have a, a, a rack of little sequencers that we're going to show off later. There's a bigger sequencer. Uh, actually, all the way over here, we have one, two, three, four, five sequencers in the first three channels there. Animog running as an instrument. Uh, the Korg Monopoly uh, iPad instrument running uh, as an instrument. Mitosynth, and then just a master bus that is feeding out to the uh, to the airplay thing that you're actually seeing on the screen. If we go into the uh, if we go into the MIDI connection view, you can see that, uh, and we all remember the MIDI matrix from last week, right? Uh, you can see that the MIDI sources across the top include all of those sequencers. So there's Otney, there's four outputs coming from something called Fugue Machine that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's something coming from the virtual keyboard. There is uh, another sequencer called Polyphase that we'll look at in a little bit, uh, Rosetta Collider, and one called Step Polyarp. So basically I got a raft of sequencers uh, feeding MIDI out into this grid from the top and, and sending it to various destinations, most conspicuously the first MIDI jack uh, on the interface because that's what sends it out through the cables to to all of the instruments. Um, I've got one of the sequencers pushing my uh, mito synth and, and so forth and so on. Uh, again, is that is that straightforward enough? Everybody understand what's yes. going on? Yes. Okay. And as you know, we can very easily in um, uh, reroute things just by touching the appropriate intersection. Right. Just a quick question, Tom. Sure. Okay, so this program here shows you UX Play is called this app. Uh, UX Play UX Play is the uh, thing that I'm using to do AirPlay sharing to my desktop for Zoom oh. purposes. So that's what that's what's that's that all that UX Play is doing is making the uh, screen of the iPad appear to you in Zoom <laughs> as a screen share, basically. Okay, and this application here is called Hum. Um, a U M. Yes. There you are. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let's just see what happens if we try one of these. How about let's start with so. so I'm having to do this sideways for some peculiar reason that I don't fully understand. Um, so what you're seeing there right now, I really wish I could get this thing to orient properly. For some reason, it thinks the screen is locked and it isn't, and I'm annoyed. Um, so what you're seeing here is, a, is an application called Fugue Machine. Uh, it has four playheads. You can see them uh, sort of running across the bottom there. And each of those playhead, sorry. Actually, I need to get rid of it for a moment. Did I do that? Did that. Did I start the transport. 
I'm sorry, this thing is driving me crazy. Let's see if I can shrink this down a little bit. Get it to where we can see the whole thing. Oh yeah, there we go. Let me stop all these things. Stop, stop, I say. Okay, let's actually see if we can make one of those make some Apparently not. How am I not living right? Hmm. Excuse me. Well, I'm sorry, but I think we've just hit our first major crash of the evening. Huh. Let me try something a little simpler. Oh, well, that would explain a lot. Now it's probably actually sending MIDI to stuff. Huh. Some mod is going on here. Well, it acts like it's not in the interface. Figure out why that is. There we go. Yes, we have time. So all we have running at the moment is one of the playheads. We can start a second playhead. And those are both driving the micro chords. So if you actually look at what's going on in the grid there, you can see the various playhead setting, sending MIDI notes at different times along the across the top right there. And if we look at how those are actually set up, you can see that I've got playheads one and two going to MIDI channel five, which is going to the micro chord.
look closely at the tops of the two generators and you should see how it's getting activated by the sequence. stop there for a second and see if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask at this point. So in, um, in, the, in the Fug Machine app, you, you've got the, the different playheads and they're, they're outputting different channels. Um, in the um, in the GUI, you've got like different gray bars. I assume those like contain different MIDI notes within those bars. Is that what's going on? I don't know. I'm... Yeah, let's look. Sure. Uh, so there's, a, let, let's, let's start at the bottom. Let's start with the thing that makes it go. Uh, if we, at the bottom, we have master stop and, uh, and start buttons. So I can stop all playheads at once by hitting this thing at the lower right. I could start all playheads at once by hitting that, assuming they're turned on. Uh, the playheads each have individual stop and start control, so I'm going to ting the green one at the lower right now. We can turn that on and off. Uh, sorry, you're muted, Les. Yeah, your uh, your screen share is not up at the moment. Oh, I'm an idiot. Okay. <laughs> Very kind of you to point that out. Of course, I couldn't figure out how to hook push my mute button either so you know <laughs> <laughs> well you know you do what you can uh, so let me stop all the playheads so if you look at the if you look at the bottom right there's a there's a master stop that will stop anything that's moving there's a master start that will start anything that's engaged to start um, each of the four playheads has a set of controls there's a style control that you see on the left that says uh, that this playhead is always going to move to the right this playhead is always going to move to the left. This playhead will go back and forth in, in, in one pair of them. This playhead will go back and forth in, in the other one. Uh, you can do variations on the tempo. This one is set up to uh, basically play quarter notes. Uh, I have no idea what that start is. I think it's start on the first bar line. I have no idea what invert does. It, I, I think it actually inverts the, the, the pattern. Uh, Octave control is obvious. This is minus one from wherever the pitch is set. You can change the pitch by an arbitrary number of, of, of uh, half steps. And then these at the side here are all the notes. So you're seeing bar lines going, it's basically a piano roll. Uh, you've got bar lines going across uh, right to left and you've got notes going uh, up and down. And of course, I just have a very simple little pattern here. Now let me, just start the uh, the blue one and maybe turn this up a little bit so you can hear it. I can reverse it. Or I can make it go back and forth. Well, let's add one that's playing this one. Is it playing eighth notes? No. It's also pitched down two octaves. And as you can see, you can play with this all day long. You can, of course, save patterns. Thank you. 
two fumble fingers you got this active thing to work from. Try to get it pitched up a little bit. There we go. So Russ, is that a bit clearer? Yeah, I, I, I guess what was confusing me, I didn't realize that each of the playheads could have different uh, transpositions. And that, because I was looking at it, I was like, well, where are all these different notes coming from? And that now I see. Yeah, and some of that, uh, actually, some of that too is the micro chord, which has some kind of internal in, uh, arpeggiation in, in that patch. Oh, right, of course, so, of course. So you're, so you're getting a little bit of that and some, and some filter stuff going on too. Yeah, yeah. Very, very neat sound. Yeah, it's fun. You can do a lot with this thing. Um, and so I think at, at, at this point, we're kind of in, uh, you know, Tom, Tom's big world of sequencers. Um, I did want to say one thing uh, before we get too far past it, which is that it is extremely handy when you're setting up one of these things uh, to have uh, some kind of MIDI, MIDI sniffer app uh, to show you exactly what's going on. Uh, because it can be very, very helpful in figuring out uh, <laughs> why you're having problems of one sort or another. The one I use uh, on the iPad is called MIDI Scope. Let's see if I can uh, figure out where I hit it for myself. There you are. Uh, let's see. I'm only listening for... So as you can see, you've got the ability to control the source of notes that you look at. I just want to look at what's on GIN one of, of the of the of the Iconos at this point. Uh, I can filter so that I get only note on and off. I can get control change. You know, I can filter by any kind of MIDI message that, that I want to. Right now I'm only interested in notes. And I'm only interested in notes at this point, as you can see on uh, on, on channel five. And if I go into the scope itself and I connect it, and I actually start something happening, which requires more motor coordination than I actually have. So for theoretically, we should be able to see a bunch of stuff happening on channels five and six. Is that true, or is that just a filter wide? Nope, sure not seeing anything. Look at all channels. Oh, you know what? I bet I can just go in Tom. Yep. Yep, I do. And let's just see if everything isn't possible in the other fingers point. There we go. Now we should be able to see anything and everything. Is that true? Oh, yeah. There we go. And you can watch the happy little parade of notes coming out of uh, coming out of the sequencer. And if in fact we wanted to limit that to a particular channel, let's do that. Let's just look at channel five. That should be a lot less traffic. Let's just actually flash that and see what we get. Yeah, now we're just getting stuff from channel five going out. So it's a very, very, very handy debugging tool when you're not at all sure what's going on with your MIDI stuff. And you can find uh, MIDI sniffing applications for basically any platform. Uh, I don't know, do any of you guys have favorites of your own? I use MIDI Toolbox. Uh huh which is also good because it does uh, um, system librarian, system exclusive librarian stuff. Uh-huh. 
meaning it's a SysX manager or it's just, just looking at SysX, SysX stuff going by? Well, let me turn my thing on. No, it, um, it's got a whole little tools toolbox. Um, can you see it there? Of, uh, you know, it, it'll do event monitors, monitor status. Um, you can use it to accept bulk dumps um, and do some control change stuff and things like that. I've had it for a long time. I don't know if it's like super current or popular, but uh -huh. it works. Yeah, one of the things I'm hoping to look at a little later tonight is, uh, uh, is, is some of the stuff that you can do with patch editors and, and patch librarians, um, also under the heading of external devices that, uh, that, that, that can run via, via an iPad. Uh, there are some there's some really nice ones. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have ever messed around with a DSI Evolver, but it's it is just it is a god awful nightmare of a thing to try to deal with from its its control panel. Let me uh, see if I can actually show you that. How about I How about I not share that screen? How about I find this? Yeah. So if we go back to the uh, go back and look at this i mean you can see what the controls on the evolve on the evolver are like it's this nightmare <laughs> of of a grid system that has controls across the top and then you select banks in, in crazy ways using the buttons down the left hand side and it, it's it's a huge it's a huge pain in the ass to actually actually do any sound design on the thing but i'll show you that later um these kinds of external applications that take it take advantage of MIDI stuff to do library work and that kind of thing are, are, are really great and really 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 helpful. Uh, so, other questions about any of this nonsense? So far, okay, so far. All right. So this is going to kind of turn into. I'm afraid it's going to turn into. Uh, Tom's big parade of sequencers, but part of the idea is to show you just exactly how much variety there is in the world of iPad sequencers and how much, uh, how relatively easy they are to use compared to having to do all that stuff in, in mods. Uh, you know, the Fugue Machine is something you might think of as being kind of a semi-generative sequencer because while the sequences are set, there are so many ways that you can tweak them and so many ways that things can interact that you get quite an interesting number of combinations and, and patterns out of it. Uh, a more deterministic one uh, is my friend Stub Polly out here. Again, I think I have to shrink down a bit so you can see what it's doing. Um, it also looks like a pretty standard sort of piano roll kind of thing. Um, we need to give it a keyboard to work with. So if we start it up, see if it's actually going anywhere. Is it it's going out on channel six, which should be theory driving the DSI to do something, potentially. Possibly. Thank you. 
you're sharing your screen, we're not seeing it. Ah. You know, you guys have got to keep me honest. Really good. How's that? Beautiful. Can you adjust your volume, please? Would you like me louder or softer? Your voice a little louder than music. <laughs> right now, okay. you're, you're drowned by the music. Through. Yeah, it's good now. Yeah. Okay, we got it way down there. Uh, okay, so other questions about this, as long as I got it sitting there? Oh, it looks great. What, the, what was the name of this app? It's called Step Polyarp. Cool. Which I think is meant to be a functional description. Uh, you can see its name actually right up at the top of the window there. Where my yep. mouse is waving back and forth. Yep. All right, let's ditch it. And this is another particular favorite of mine. What? I'm going to have to talk this thing out with you. Got that. So this is one called Autony, um, the unreliable sequence generator. <laughs> and as you can see from the controls, you can have um, any number of steps in the sequence up to 64 you can set it for a key and a chord. I've got it set up for uh, C Aeolian at the moment. Uh, you can transpose it. I've got it down an octave uh, just now. You can set the clock unit to quarter notes, full bar, half notes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And most interestingly about it, you can uh, change its reliability so that if you actually dial that way down, there's only a 50% or at this point, a 49% chance that what is in the sequence at that point is actually going to play. So you can actually get an awful lot of variation out of this thing. Let me just see where I'm sending it. Oh, I don't want to send it there. I want to send it to five. Um, and let me just make sure that the grid is going somewhere where I would like it to. Is that true? It is not true. Okay. So now in theory, if I turn up the microphone. I don't know if you can actually see the little black rectangle moving there. So we're playing with the chord a little bit. 
And that's it, running to the USA. Okay, let's pause there for questions for a second. Anybody got any? Yeah, Tom, I have one. It's a little, uh, I mean, I've always thought as apps as apps, but some of these apps are standalone and some of them work more like VSTs. I mean, there's distinctions. Some generate sound, some just send out MIDI. And, and how do they work with, with OM to, uh, to uh, achieve that? Well. Well, OM is, is basically set up as a, as, a, as a hosting program. So if I go to add another channel, you can see that I get my choice of do I want to do, I want to do an audio channel, do I do, want to do a MIDI channel, or interestingly enough, I can save entire track scripts uh, with, the, uh, you know, with, the, with the instrument, the effects, and so forth, and so on, and, and import those if I want to, if I have standard setups, you know, standard track script setups that I want to use from you know, session to session. But in this case, you know, I'm going to add a MIDI, I'm going to add a MIDI thing. If I, if I hit there, uh, I get a, a menu that offers me either audio unit type MIDI processors, AUs, or audio unit extension type processors that tend to be a little more ambitious. If I were to have declared this, let me get rid of this. If I were to add an audio channel, um, I would have my choice here of anything I wanted to use, either an interop audio application or uh, an audio unit extension or uh, Audio bus source, file player, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. But in the in what amounts to an effect slot, I am limited to audio unit extensions and interop audio and stuff. So basically, the framework for all of the stuff you're asking about, Ken, is is, is OM itself, right? I mean, it 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 gives you a, a hosting environment in which which to run all that stuff. Is is that helpful? Yes, very, because if, you know, like we all have a big pile of stuff and then this seems to be a good way to sort out what's what. Well, yeah, uh, it's a very good way to structure stuff. And I mean, that, that takes me back to a point that I was trying to make, uh, trying to make last week, which is that one of the problems that the iPad has, and I, I, I think in, in, in a way, Nick was pointing at this at the very beginning of the session, you, you, you get all this stuff running and, you know, suddenly you're fumbling around on this iPad that has a million different screens available to you and all of these keyboards and 16,000 controls, every one of, you know, everybody's game controls in a different place. You know, how do you, how do you make some sense out of that in terms of live performance? And certainly, Putting it into a structure like OM, where you know what you've got and where it's routed, and you can very clearly see, you know, uh, believe me, this picture that you're looking at right now makes a lot more sense than the photograph I showed you of the tangle of cables running from unit to unit. It's a little easier to figure out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it helps you make sense of it. And if you're if you're performing live, of course, that's 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 very important because you want to be able to go straight for whatever it is you want to uh, whatever it is you want to uh, tweak. 
Now, um, something that I'm not able to do tonight very well uh, is, is show you what happens when you hook up an external MIDI controller to the ALM itself. Uh, last week, I showed you guys a, a thing called the MIDI Fighter Twister, which is basically nothing but a knob thing. Uh, but in fact, you can make that work with any of these. Uh, if I open up this, you'll see a bunch of stuff that is exposed to MIDI by the applications themselves. Not terribly interesting in this case because it's basically volume and uh, muting and, and, and that sort of thing. But every one of these uh, has a MIDI learn function attached. So if I wanted to teach this thing to respond to some particular knob on my MIDI fighter twister, I would simply hit this thing, hit MIDI learn, tweak the knob, and the channel would actually learn, OK, I'm supposed to respond to, to that knob in this way. Uh, the channel I happen to pick here is a fairly simple-minded example. If we go to something uh, a little more complicated, well, I don't have anything a little more complicated here at the moment, so we'll have to look at that later. But the point is that, that practically uh, ALM itself and many, 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 many of the iPad instruments do have MIDI learn functions that make it quite easy to get them to respond to external controllers, whether those are keyboards or twisty knobs or, or what have you. And in fact, if you look uh, at any of my live sets, 90% of the time what you'll see is, is me with one hand on the iPad and the other hand somewhere on the MIDI fighter twister. And, and, and more often it's on the twister because everything we do with this when we do live sets is really about live mixing. Any more questions while we're here? Ken, are you happy? Why? Oh, very. Yeah, this is this is brave new world for me. So thanks for, uh, uh, you know, the potential's all there. Yeah. Now, you know, from from here on out, I mean, it's really about dumb little sequencers and what they do. I haven't been working with this one from Rosetta long enough to really have any idea what the hell it does. <laughs> uh, but it seems to be pretty good at generating quasi-random stuff. There's a whole suite of these in, in the Rosetta sequencer suite. Uh, they all do different stuff. This is the only one I've really messed with. Um, and I don't know. Let's, 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 let's see what it sounds like. Let's see here. Put it going out on some channel we might like. How about five? And do we have a route for that? So Rosetta has my MIDI. Now, okay, so now that's just the collider. Let's see what that looks like on the actual screen. Okay, anybody who can tell me how that visual display translates to what we're hearing gets an extra special prize. Any takers? I mean, it, it, se it, it, it seems like it, it sounds a note whenever one of the dots hits one of the edges. <laughs> That's about all I'm making out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, okay. So if you look over here, you know, you're make, you're making sense there. If you uh, if, if you look here, you'll see, you know, there's wall sound that's on, collision sound that's off. Okay, if we turn on collision sound, can we turn it? I not with my not with my mouse, I can't. So maybe now when they bang into each other, we'll hear something different. I'm going to increase the number of hadrons. I have no idea what that does. Makes collisions more frequent. 
Okay, I'm having a hard time associating this with any kind of music that I would particularly want to make. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Yes. More dots equals less sound for some reason. Yeah. Um, this one, this is one called Polyphrase. And I actually need to dive in here a second and uh, put up a MIDI clock application because polyphase for some reason it's one of the it's it's the only one that we're looking at today that does not have um, does not have ableton link i'm going to send polyphase some clock you can see, by the way, we looked at this last week, but what, what you're seeing is something that translates the Ableton Live uh, tempo to, uh, to a MIDI clock. Uh, you can see the Ableton Live tempo at the top is 65, and the, and the MIDI tempo is, 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 is a little less stable than that, but it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And, uh, let me find my way back to polyphase. And you can see that it's it's running now. Here's a question: What did I tell it to do? Okay, so it's sending. This thing is a nightmare of complexity, and I don't understand it particularly well. Uh, it has four outbound channels, much like Fugue Machine does, a master and uh, and three followers. I have two of them set to channel five. I have uh, two of them set to channel six. And as you can see the what you're seeing there looks very much like the the the, the, the four playheads in uh, in fugue machine kind of disentangled um, it is playing in d minor at the moment for some reason i'll turn that to c minor uh, and each of those is going out uh, it, it could go to as many as four instruments if you wanted or, or, or even more than that but right now they're paired up to a two so in theory, as I said, that. oh, I know why this isn't happening. This isn't happening because Tom, who is not very smart, the way polyphase is mapping. Now, theoretically, should be making some noise. That is it. It doesn't seem to be. Oh, no, it isn't really. This one just pays no attention to the auto routing group. <laughs> you have to do all of its MIDI stuff in its MIDI panel. There are about 10,000 ways you can make this thing sequence differently. There's an hour long tutorial uh, that is linked from uh, my tutorials page that. To be honest with you, I have not looked at yet, and probably should have preparing for this. But you can uh, you can definitely do some very 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 interesting stuff with it. It's quite quite. And you can change velocity. You can transpose for each track. It, 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 in some ways, it does a lot of the same stuff Fugue Machine does. Where you can change the note length, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can immediately generate random sequences. You can reverse. I don't know what prune does. Let's find out. Cuts down on stuff. Clearly. Uh, you can clone the master to everybody else. 
You can do obsidian sequence. You can set a random weight. Etc. 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 So you've got a lot of room there to just play around and get stuff that is both generative and highly irregular and, and non-repetitious and just generally speaking fun. Okay, I think I've shown you guys a very small selection of the approximately 10 kajillion sequencers that are available for the iPad. But uh, another one worth mentioning, actually, we saw last week, uh, that is, is patterning the uh, percussion the percussion thing. It can actually be used as a sequencer, and if I wanted to do polyrhythmic stuff, that is definitely how I would do it. Uh, because it's just so easy to do polyrhythms in that thing. Uh, but like I say, there's there's another 50 sequencing apps out there. Uh, there's stuff that is designed to look like your favorite hardware sequencer. There is stuff that is designed to look like nothing else on earth. There is stuff that is deliberately designed to make it hard for you to figure out how it works. Uh, you know, there are all, any and all levels of, of perversity, perversity. Utility, utility out there. So, anything further? Questions? Before we uh, move on a little bit? You guys are awful quiet. We're shy. Yeah, I guess. that That's you all over, Joe. You're just you're just uh, uh, very good at explaining this. We, we just we just don't have any questions. <laughs> so let, let's let's go back to what I really should have said in the beginning before I started demoing. I mean, there, there's there's an as you can see, it's possible to get lost in an awful lot of complexity here. Uh, and you really need to start when you're when you're setting out to design something like this. You really need to think about some very very simple questions, right? I mean, let, let, let's start with who's conducting the band, right? Who's 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 beating time? Where is where is my clock going to come from? Uh, and who needs to know about it? Uh, you'll notice that I'm not actually feeding any clock to the hardware instruments, because as long as I'm driving them with sequencers, they don't need it. If I was running their arpeggiators, they would need it <laughs> if I wanted to keep them in sync. But an awful lot of the time, if you're, if you're just doing all your sequencing off the iPad, you really don't have to worry about getting clocked to the hardware at all. Uh, and that makes life much, much, much simpler. Uh, you've got a lot of choices of clock sources, too. Um, I'm using Ableton Link, and I'm driving it very specifically with something I'll show you in a moment called the Missing Link, which is a, a very nice little hardware tool. Um, but you could use a software MIDI clock uh, from iOS. You could use an external hardware clock of some kind. Uh, the transport mechanism in ALM has a, a MIDI clock of its own. You know, you've got many choices of clock source. Um, you need to think that through. For the most part, I use Ableton Link to synchronize uh, everything on the iPad, and I use it to drive the MIDI clock through this uh, through the Link to MIDI thing I showed you a moment ago. And the reason for that uh, is that a feature of Ableton Link is that you can actually change the tempo from any instrument that is participating in the Link. Uh, which turns out to be quite handy when you're playing live and you've got Animog up on the screen and you want to be able to adjust the tempo from Animog without having to reach over and hit anything else, right? Because you can you, you can basically adjust the, the tempo from any so inside any software instrument, uh, or also using the uh, the knob on the missing link. So so I tend to do it that way. I tend to drive the hardware off of the software. Um, because I think it's easier, and I think it gives me better better playability. Uh,
you know, as I say, you also need to think a little bit about what really needs clock and, and, and what doesn't. <laughs> because again, so often you're just driving stuff with sequences. Let me show you the let me show you the missing link here for a second. If I can. Let me do this time. I'll remember to share the screen. That'll be helpful. There we go. So this is what the thing looks like. It's got this. It's got this big knob in the center that basically adjusts the tempo. Uh, it puts out um, USB MIDI, and it also puts out CD. Runs off USB power. It has a variety of settings that you can access basically via that front knob and, and you can set up, you know, how many, how many pulses per quarter note and all of that stuff you want. I've, I've used one of these actually to drive um, the little teenage engineering pocket operators. Uh, you can actually sync using this. Um, what's so nice about it though, is that it has built into it its own Wi-Fi access point. It can either work, you can either do Ableton Link via whatever Wi-Fi you have running, or it can be an access point of its own. Um, that latter trick tends to come in very handy when you're working in a venue that either doesn't have Wi-Fi at all or doesn't have reliable Wi-Fi, which is very often the case in bars where the millennials are connecting and disconnecting their phones every 13 seconds. Uh, so it, it's quite a handy little thing. It's a, it's, it's a, a nice piece of engineering, um, and we've used it, uh, oh, with as many as five or six players in the, in the old Ithaca bleep salons when we were still able to, to, to do stuff in person. It's a very, very handy little device made by a company called Circuit Happy. Uh, and really nice if what you want to be able to do is, is tie uh, Ableton Link stuff together with, uh, well, first of all, across multiple machines, but, but secondly, with, with, uh, with hardware. Very, very useful little device. Um, so I guess, you know, to, to put a kind of benediction on this whole thing, um, <laughs> When you're designing something like this, when, when you're using multiple devices across software and hardware and so forth and so on, it's important to think about stuff, about how you're going to design the thing from the beginning. I mean, just, just from the ground up. Uh, and to be consistent in the choices you make about where you're going to do stuff. Uh, so for example, I mentioned last week that, yes, I have the option to do my MIDI routing in ARMS MIDI routing grid, uh, which I like for convenience, I could also do it inside the iConnect using their configuration utility. I could also do it using some kind of patching system within a laptop computer that's connected up to the whole thing like Jack and Linux. And, and, and in my large rig, I actually do, uh, I actually do run all of the routing there. Let me just let me just show you the the, the nightmare that that actually is, uh, because I think you will be amused by it. Uh, this is whoops, what a way. This is part of what the patch <laughs> on my large rig looks like. Uh, it it gets very it's get, it gets very silly from there. But the the, the, the point is that you just need to be. Uh, very consistent about the choices you make uh, in where you're going to do routing, how you're going to do routing, and that sort of thing, because that will save you enormous amounts of time, particularly on live shows. Um, I, 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 Charles Schreiner and I were once joking that we were probably the only two people in our, our circle of musical friends who would ever take a road rig and take it apart and put it back together five times just to be sure that we could. Uh, that comes from touring. <laughs> um, and I have to say, there was actually one point in my, my, my opera production management days uh, when I sent a, a change order into a scenery shop. It was a $5,000 change order, and its only purpose was to ensure that all of the bolts in the set were the same size. Uh, <laughs> And the reason for that is that when you have four hours to set up, 
<laughs> the barber in Seville. You don't want to be looking for the right size bolt. And when they, as they inevitably do, when they all get stripped, you want to be able to deal with that with one die set. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm very much in the, in the mindset that says, okay, well, figure out what you're going to do, figure out the best way you're going to do it and make sure it's kind of all in one layer someplace accessible and that you, and that you stick with the program because otherwise inevitably you're going to be having one of those moments that we all do, unfortunately, all too often where you've got five minutes until the show's supposed to go offline and nothing is working or some significant thing is, is not working. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, okay, there are lots of layers here. There are lots of opportunities for flexibility. It's all in software. All of that makes all kinds of things available to you, but, but for God's sake, make a decision about where you're going to do it and be consistent about where you're going to do it. Because if you don't, it, it's a living nightmare. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Donations? Oh, yes, donations. <laughs> All right, I got one more thing I want to show you, uh, just to give you some idea of what's possible. Uh, where, where, where do I have this thing stashed? Is it going to take me to the slide? Oh, there it is. Okay, let me just, for the uh, sake of amusement remind you of what the uh, front of that evolver looks like you've got eight knobs across the top and you've got i don't know 10 or 12 rows of things all of which are bimodal depending on how many times you press that button um, all of which control filters and vcas and this and that and 19,000 other things you can think of and trying to do sound design on this thing is nightmare. However, there's this, which is an iPad based editor uh, that actually works with the Evolver and makes the whole thing actually make some sense because you can actually see on this interface what the signal flow is. You can dive into stuff and change it in sensible ways. And it, it writes and it, it reads and writes patches directly from the instrument using using sysx as, as as Joe was alluding to earlier. It's just a very, 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 very helpful thing to be able to do that. And there are a surprising number of instruments for which these kinds of editors are actually available. Let me see if I can. This will take a second. Really? Sorry, she had this up in advance, but I didn't. Uh, yep. So this is, uh, these are some that I found in about the first 15 seconds uh, that I was looking. These are all patch, these are all patch management tools that work from the iPad and can be used with, with various hardware instruments. So for example, Sound Tower, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. So Sound Tower has done some for all of the Dave Smith instruments and for the Kurzweils. Uh, this one, there's one for the Virus and Virus T1 for Code Access. This patch base editor, uh, I mean, it covers a million of them.
I use patch base. I love that thing. It's it's uh, visually it's kind of a little complicated because it flattens the way it presents everything. But uh, I I was lucky and I bought in when you could still buy the pay a big chunk of money and you get all the editors thing. Uh huh. They don't do that anymore, huh? Uh, I think I think now they either want you to subscribe or you buy individual editors. Although even still, I mean the the cost of the editors is not a lot considering what you get out of it. I mean, like it's it's killer with the the Casio CZ architecture. Uh huh. Especially because you can run it wireless to the Casio and just have the iPad floating around wherever you need it. Oh, I just did myself in here. So Yeah, anyway, there were a couple others there that I was going to show you. Oh, here's, here's the link. Duh. One second. Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, that there's MIDI Quest. SysX Base is more of a librarian for patch management. So is MIDI Quest librarian. Uh, there, there's there's a ton of these. I've seen them for various of the bulk instruments. There's a bunch. Uh, there's a couple that. Uh, there's one that. Uh, there's definitely one that does the Volca FM. There's a bunch of them. And if you if you look around the iOS App Store, you'll you'll see them. And they 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 are as Joe says, they are just tremendous time savers. Okay, uh, I think I'm running a little short. I, I think you can all take it for granted that if I can get a sequencer to play as a hardware synth, I can get a keyboard to play a, a, an iOS synth. <laughs> I'm not going to bother to walk you through that, but uh, uh, let me know. I mean, are there are there more questions here? Is there other stuff you'd like to look at? Who's puzzled? Who's awake? Um, uh, just one thing, you, you know, uh, as we're talking about editors, uh, one thing I found, and, and I, I've only done a little bit on the iPad, but I, I thought I'd mention it since, since no one else has, and, and maybe you guys have already seen all this, uh, but there's a thing called uh, TB MIDI stuff, uh, you know, T as in Tom, B as in Bruce, oh, easy to remember, right? Um, and, uh, it, it basically uh, is a control surface for MIDI stuff. Um, but what's unique about it is that um, it has a library of controls like knobs and sliders and switches and stuff like that. And you can create your own control surface. And where, where that's useful is for synths that don't have editors that you know, maybe are a little more obs obscure. Uh, but you, you can do uh, SysX stuff and stuff with it. And it actually comes with a couple of templates for things like the microcorg. Uh, the, the one that was interesting to, to me, um, it was uh, there, there's, there's a, a, a template for it for the Alesis Andromeda, which has like literally a thousand parameters per patch. Um, and so, you know, the, the guy, the guy who put this template thing for it to, together for it, you know, really spent a lot of time because there's just all these different pages, you know, the, oh my gosh, it's like 50 different pages of controls for the thing. Um, but that's a really useful one and it's like four bucks um, that if you have some sense that you can't find an editor for, you can make your own. Yeah, there's an iOS version of Lemur too that does does much that that same kind of thing, and there are also really sophisticated patch and keyboard managers. Uh, typically, they work by sending program control messages to synth that know how to change patches with program control messages. But they but but you can use those to build really complicated keyboard setups, one thing splits, and all that kind of stuff. But you can also use them to to, to put together set lists. So if you've got a set of patches associated with, you know, 
playlist and a bunch of songs and what have you, 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 you can actually manage that. And of course, if you're out there, you know, grinding out the Rolling Stones tour for the 96th time, it's a, it's a handy thing to have. And I, I've even contemplated using one for uh, complicated live setups for, uh, for like multi-song sets and, and that kind of thing. Ne never have bothered to do it, but they're out there. Another thing is, is and, I, and I was pointing this out last week, is just the, uh, the, the use of the iPad as a, as a touch screen control for uh, the other other stuff. So this is uh, this is TC Data, which acts as a as a as a touch controller. I have it set up uh, to to work with a cord radius at the moment. Um, this one where I'm moving my finger around at the moment is controlling pitch. Uh, this is controlling a mixer because the radius actually has four voices that, that, that you can mix in, in, in various ways. And this is the, it has two filters and this is actually controlling cutoff on both of them. Uh, all of that configured here. It's a pain in the neck to configure, um, but once you have it, you've got something that is very, 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 very playable. Uh, and indeed, you know, I've been slow to move to do anything with MPE because this does so much of what I would want MPE <laughs> to do that I, I just have not seen seen fit to take the plunge that that day is coming i have a sensible morph and, and i intend to learn how to use it but uh i, I really with with this i really haven't I, I really haven't needed it so much and there are you know there are all kinds of virtual keyboards and that kind of stuff what else folks Yeah, I have a question. This is more for uh, my son Kyle, who's lurking in the background here. Uh, uh, when you have, <laughs> especially multiple performances, when we when Pixelator is getting together, I mean, what are the are there any challenges with linking or syncing two, three, four iPads together? Uh, not if you're using uh, for tempo purposes. Yes. Uh, not if you're not if you're using Ableton Link. Uh, because as long as they're all able to look at the same Wi-Fi network, you can main, you, you, you can maintain synchronization on all of them. Uh, Jim and I do that all the time. Jim Spitzman and I do that all the time. Uh, and the I, and I took. The, oh, oh sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I I I stole the uh, Mike Mike Mentley trick of keeping an Airport Express around to be just your default network, not connected to anything to link stuff up. Mm -hmm. and it works very well yeah the missing link can serve that role too actually because it's, it's got its own wi-fi access point yeah we've previously relied on just not doing it at all and winging uh -huh. it so it'd be nice to be organized for once did i, I, mean, did I, I see a link did oh, i see a, a look of confusion on joe's face when he said uh that device name missing link I don't think so. We were showing it off early. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I got here really late, so my apologies. My my question about the missing link is it looks like, so it doesn't do DIN MIDI, but if you plug in a class compliant MIDI interface, it'll do DIN MIDI. Is that, is that the yeah, deal with I mean, that? I've, I've done it. I know that the guy who, who makes them is now thinking about adding, now thinking about adding five pin MIDI. MIDI. I don't think he's done it yet, but uh, I've achieved the same effect by basically clocking uh, an Arturia key step with it and taking taking the DIN connections off of that. I mean, there's there's a hundred ways you can do it uh, because anything that will take anything that will take USB MIDI and, and essentially pump it to a to a five pin DIN jack will, will work fine. Any other last minute concerns or questions?
falling a little short of an hour, but that's okay with me. It's okay with you guys. Are we doing an, another session of this? Uh, I don't know. You want to? And if so, what do you want to do? Uh, how, how much masochism are you in for? <laughs> Well, I'm kind of curious, you know, it's like I'm my big thing is if I can point my camera here is I'm I'm using I'm using my launch control with everything and I figured out the wiring problem by just not wiring it. Uh -huh. So I'm just I'm I'm curious sometimes what people are doing in terms of you know getting that hardware control into their stuff. Um because I'm using a I'm using a uh uh focus right dock which for some insane reason they didn't put din midi on or any other way of getting stuff out except the host interface oh man so okay <laughs> and i think everybody has stopped making docks basically they, that market looks like it dried up yeah i mean it's it's funny it looks like it's changing i i, I went and looked at the iConnect line of stuff the other day thinking you know, I wonder. I wonder what they've done with it since since I bought in. And the fact is, they've discontinued most of the stuff I'm using. I suspect because USB MIDI has become so much more common. Um, honestly, putting this thing together, which has been something of a nightmare because of the way AirPlay behaves with the iPad and and, and so forth and so on. Uh, You can do complicated routing without a laptop. I don't think I want to anymore. <laughs> I don't think I want to do it all in hardware. Uh, but you know, tastes tastes vary, and I, and I know Joe that if you could do it with a pocket calculator, you would. So uh, you're muted. <laughs> you're still muted. I'm no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I had the perfectly timed craft work line. Oh. I don't know if anybody, this is peripherally related, but I picked up one of these Blocus MIDI hubs, which is like modular synthesis for MIDI signals. And that that's been really good because I just I use the I use one of these um lightning to USB B, plug it into my MIDI hub and plug it into whatever. And it's, you know, it's been great as far as throwing signals around to the hardware. Yeah, again, there's a lot of ways you can do this. I, I have a preference for doing it in software, but, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot of ways you can do it. And the only thing that's important is to uh, be consistent about how you choose to do it. Because you can create a god-awful mess if you decide, well, I'm going to I'm going to do some routing. I'm going to do some routing in my OM grid and then I'm going to do some with my magic MIDI, my Joe Wall magic MIDI mapper. Uh, and then it's going to be five minutes from some show and I'm going to be sitting there saying, and what the fuck is putting out channel six? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and I, I don't want to be in that position. That, that's why I became a minimalist. I just, I threw, every time something failed in my rig, I threw it away and now I have nothing. Cowards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I totally understand. No, my next car, gig is going to- If the car is not full, it doesn't count. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm, the, I'm the counterpoint to you guys. I'm like, I'm like, can I do a, a whole gig with just a black box? Oh, don't think that sometimes I don't do that because I do. <laughs> I, I completely get it. Joe has a small car too. Hey, yeah. hey, I, I love iOS, uh, you know, music. I love making iOS music, and it's great to just take one device, you know, that can almost fit in your pocket. It's fantastic. You mean almost? Well, I was thinking iPad, but yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. This is my iPod, iPad Nano. Yeah, it kind of is. I mean, that's what we all started with, right? I mean, I mean, day one, that was the first thing I went and looked for was, was music apps for my iPhone. Oh, no, this is the iPod Touch. Yeah, same thing. I mean, all the, all, all the fun without accidentally getting a phone call in the middle of the show. <laughs> oh yeah that's a lesson like you learn early on you know 
uh, airplane mode is your friend. <laughs> here, here's a question. Like Tom, you might you might be the person to ask, but is is anybody here using um, Ape Matrix? I had a flirtation with it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so romantic when you say it that way. <laughs> well, things didn't work. Out. No, I, I haven't I haven't used it much at all. The only person I know who invested a lot of time in it was Elijah, my brother Eric. Uh, I have heard it described as uh, as obscure. It's well, it's definitely once you're in that Apesoft aesthetic, it's kind of easy to figure it out because it it works the weird way that all Apesoft stuff works. Where it's like, why does this need an LFO? What is it? <clears throat> it's just a, it's a routing matrix um, that works kind of the same way as Elm, but Ape Softier. So <laughs> it's, it's just. I'm trying to think if I actually have it installed on this, this iPad. I have to call the Oxford English Dictionary now and tell them there's a new word Ape Softier? Yep. Yeah, I want credit. <laughs> oh, you definitely will get it. <laughs> Is uh, I do not have it on this, unfortunately. And 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 in on you know on a related note to that is is. Uh, is uh, is audio bus basically kind of like deprecated out of everybody's rigs at this point? It was certainly deprecated out of mine until I learned that it would do something that I thought I wanted it to do, which is to allow you to route audio to both the USB and the headphone connector at the same time, which it will do in multi-route mode. It just won't do that and also do airplay, which is why I couldn't use it for this. Yeah. Uh, but that that is a handy thing. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I saw you had you would ask that question in a one of those ios forums and i thought well i don't have that problem but i it's because i was using audio bus all along and i think it just defaults to keeping the headphone jack as a duplicate of whatever the the main audio app is yeah it does if you have multi -route mode on. Uh, but i find um uh, just a lot easier to use the, 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 and the other thing that's nice about it is that in um if you're running an AUV3 piece of software, be it an effect or a synth or what have you, and it, it's plugged in there, all of its parameters are are exposed to external MIDI control. So you can go in and do MIDI learn on things of insane complexity. Yeah. And in fact, the, the, the problem that you've got at that point from the, the point of view of playability is that I work with a little MIDI twister device that has four bank it has 16 knobs uh four banks of 16 knobs and i tend to use them row wide so it's like you know four knobs per instrument uh and so i have a choice to make about which four parameters i think are going to give me the most playability and you know very often that's a filter but uh with newer software synths like uh, quanta comes to mind uh, continua comes to mind uh, they have macro settings that can that can change multiple parameters at one time. That 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 capture is uh, you know you can do you can do a lot you can do a lot with one of those little switches. And if you decide to do something on controllers, I'll I'll haul that out. Um, it's it's not the it's it's not the easiest thing to do on a compact rig. I was thinking about doing it for tonight, and I just thought no, that, that's. That, that, that's a bridge too far. <laughs> Anything else, gentlemen? Ladies? Gentlemen? Chicken? So, Joe, have you tried that Heinbach app yet? Oh. Which one? Um, you're talking about the Gauss? Yeah. I could never remember the name of it. I don't know why. I've I've got it. I'm just, you know, I'm just such a loopy maniac, um, partly to frustrate Tom. Um, <laughs> so I look at it and I'm like, oh, this is really cool. 
but it kind of it's cool for things other than what I'm doing. But I do have it. I, I it's something I'm going to dig into at some point. I've been using Gauss. It works pretty well. Yeah, it's 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 fun for creating like bed type things. Yeah, I'm finding. Which type things? Bed, like um. Oh, okay. <laughs> like you could use it to create loops that you could export to use somewhere else. Yeah, you know, like I, I, I like I like creating weird things that I could put into a, my morphogene module, if you know what that is. It's a it's like a granulizer looper um weird uh Euro rack module. It's difficult to describe. Cool. That's a nice app. Euchre one is, is is nice too. I, I have yet to unravel it's it's many mystery. What's what's it called again? Yukawa? I don't know. Um, is is it like a Japanese word? Like I'm fishing for spelling. Tom, did we lose Tom? Hope I'm here. So what was that app name you just said? Yukawa. Y U K A W A. Okay, so it is like a uh, sort of Japanese looking. Check it out. Sounds like we're done. Okay, I think we are. Thank you, everybody. It's been a blast. Thank you. Uh, we'll Thanks. Think about doing Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Good seeing everybody. Well, have a good night. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, stop the recording.